Welcome to the Evolution of Mormon Doctrine, Jesus Christ video. All right, we're going to be using Charles Harrell's book uh, quite a bit in this video. It's entitled, This Is My Doctrine, The Development of Mormon Theology. It came out in 2011. If you're interested in the evolution of Mormon doctrine, this is the book to get, and I highly recommend it. Uh, so the first slide uh, here from his book it says, in LDS theology, Jesus Christ is the second member of the Godhead and the creator and redeemer of the world. Okay, so from the same source here, uh, Mormons, like traditional Christians, see numerous references to Christ in the Old Testament. But what do Bible scholars think? Uh, well, critical Bible scholars, on the other hand, see no direct references at all and contend that any allusion to Christ must be read into the Old Testament narratives. So according to Bible scholars, Jesus uh, doesn't really show up in the Old Testament. All right, a comment uh, from the Bible scholar Raymond E. Brown, uh, his book, uh, is entitled The Birth of the Messiah, 1977. Uh, he's pictured above here. He says, There is no evidence that Old Testament writers foresaw with precision even a single detail in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. So according to this scholar, Raymond E. Brown, uh, there's really nothing <laughs> uh, that the Old Testament writers saw that could be pinned uh, pinned on Jesus or, or pinpoint uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And even Mormon scholars and professors have noticed this and have commented on it. Uh, there's a comment here from BYU professor Kent P. Jackson. He's pictured above. He wrote an article in the Enzyme talking about this in August of 1999. He says, from the time of Moses to the end of the Old Testament, there are no clear and explicit references to Jesus Christ and his gospel. So from the early part of the Old Testament to the end of it, there are no clear references to Christ. So the Old Testament is not about Christ. According to critical Bible scholarship, all that one can find or all that one can defensively show is that the Old Testament foreshadows Christ. All right, another comment here by Harrell. Harrell is a Mormon, and he's a BYU professor. I think he works in the engineering department, though. But he's done done a, a lot of research on this, uh, this issue, the development of Mormon uh, doctrine and theology. Uh, so he says, uh, whether Israel's plight in the Old Testament intentionally foreshadows the life and sufferings of Christ or whether its symbolism just happens to be universal enough to fit this and a variety of similar situations is a conclusion left to faith. But Harold does kind of talk more about this, and he's going to talk about it, that this idea, these ideas of Christ that supposedly foreshadow him are just universal ideas that, that apply to kings and rulers and coronation ceremonies and stuff that we're going to get into. All right, so what did the writers of the New Testament say about this issue? Uh, well, they proclaimed that all Old Testament prophets prophesied of Christ. <laughs> that was their interpretation. Uh, not, not really true, though. Uh, that's why the Jews believe in the Old Testament, but they don't believe in the New Testament because they, they don't see Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, and, that's, and that the spirit of prophecy itself is the testimony of Jesus. So th these are the opinions of the writers of the New Testament. All right. Well, what does it say in the Book of Mormon? Well, during the Old Testament times uh, of the Book of Mormon, Christ has talked about, talked about quite a bit. Uh, so the Book of Mormon presents itself as a tangible witness that righteous people living before Christ in both the Eastern and Western hemispheres were well acquainted with the Savior and the plan of redemption. So it's different than the Old Testament. Uh, during Old Testament times in the Book of Mormon, uh, they talk about Christ.
Uh, Book of Mormon prophets identified what they consider to be unmistakable references to Christ in numerous Old Testament passages. Like the New Testament, the Book of Mormon proclaims that all prophets testified of Christ. Joseph Smith's teachings remove all doubt on this issue for Latter-day Saints by inserting explicit references to Christ into his inspired revision of the Bible. He's probably talking about the Old Testament here, inserting ideas of Christ uh, into the Old Testament in Joseph Smith's inspired revision of the Bible, or the uh, JST, Joseph Smith Translation of the Bible. All right, the first chapter of the Joseph Smith Translation of Genesis uh, has three references to the only begotten of the Father, or Christ, which, which is three more than the entire KJV Old Testament. So Joseph Smith is inserting Christ into the Old Testament, into Genesis, uh, where he was not there before. Three references just in Genesis to Christ, which is three more than the entire KJV Old Testament, the, you know, the regular translation. All right, uh, Book of Mormon prophets knew the precise details of where Jesus would be born, the name of his mother, and even the exact year of his birth. <laughs> so the writers of the Old, Old Testament didn't know any of this stuff, but suddenly now during Old Testament times in the Book of Mormon, these Book of Mormon prophets know all this detail about Jesus. How did they know it? Well, because Joseph Smith knew it. <laughs> and Joseph Smith is the writer of the Book of Mormon. Presumably, maybe he had help with others, uh, from others. Maybe uh, maybe the Sidney Rigdon uh, Spalding theory ho holds some weight. I'm not sure. I'm going to make a video on that next. Uh, but it's it's interesting that they have all this precise detail where uh, where he Jesus Jesus will be born, the name of his mother Mary, the year of his birth. That's because Joseph Smith uh, knew these details uh, during the 1800s. All right, a statement from the Bible scholar J. J. M. Roberts. He's pictured above. Uh, his book is The Bible and the Ancient Near East, 2002. I'm, I'm sure he has other books as well. But he says, Of the 39 occurrences of the Hebrew word for Messiah in the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament, of those 39 uh, words for Messiah, not one of them refers to an expected figure of the future, which would be Christ, right? He was going to come in the future. Uh, and Christ's coming, or, or whose coming, will coincide with the inauguration of an era of salvation. So 39 times in the Old Testament uh, it uses the word uh, for Messiah. Not sure what that word is. I have to look that up. Uh, but not one of them refers to an expected figure of the future like Christ, or a, or a figure that's going to come and bring salvation uh, to mankind. All right, so who or what were these words that, uh, that mean Messiah or anointed one? Who were they referring to? Well, J.J. M. Roberts tells us, uh, every reference to a Messiah or an anointed one in the Old Testament pertains to a past or present political or religious leader who is appointed by God and not an expected future figure. It had to be somebody in the past or the present, a political person, a leader, a king, a religious leader. It was not talking about anybody in the future, so it could not have been uh, talking about Christ. Most Bible scholars see Jewish expectations of a Messiah as a later development in Judaism occurring during the first century or two prior to the Christian era. Uh, so much later than, uh, you know, the Old Testament. All right, we have another Old Testament scholar who says basically the same thing. Uh, Joaquin Becker, his book is Messianic Expectation in the Old Testament from 1980. He says, 
There was not even such a thing as messianic expectation until the last two centuries BC. So uh, messianic expectation, that means Christ. Uh, all through the Old Testament, there really wasn't that expectation of something that was read and interpreted back into the Old Testament. All right, back to Harold's book. Uh, Jesus is universally recognized by Christians as the Son of God, a title which refers to his divine sonship as the only begotten of the Father. The LDS understanding of this title is that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God in the flesh. That is, God was literally the biological Father of Jesus. Latter-day Saints also assert that Christ's spirit was literally begotten of God in the pre-existence. But since Mormonism teaches that we are all literally the spirit offspring of God in the pre-existence, the title Son of God is more generally used in LDS discourse to denote Christ's biological relationship to the Father in the flesh. All right, well, what did the, the words Son of God mean in the Old Testament? Well, they meant something different. Uh, in the Old Testament, Son of God was a title given to individuals who entered into a special or favored relationship with God. All right, another statement about this from Gerald O'Collins. He's pictured above. Uh, his book here is Christology. A Biblical, Historical, and Systematic Study of Jesus, which came out in 1995. Uh, he says, In the Old Testament, divine sonship was attributed to angelic beings, was attributed to angelic beings, the chosen people, and their king. So this divine sonship, or the Son of God, was different in the Old Testament. Refer to angels, uh, the chosen people, I guess the Israelites, and their kings, so not didn't necessarily have to refer uh, refer uh, to Jesus. And so Harold makes a very direct statement here. He says, "No passages in the Old Testament containing the expression Son of God appears to have had Christ or a Messiah figure in mind. None of them. <laughs> it was either the chosen people, it was a king, maybe an angel." But none of these passages in the Old Testament where it says Son of God refers uh, to Christ or a Messiah. Though Christ is referred to as the Son of God over 30 times in the New Testament, uh, in only a few instances does this title pertain to his biological birth. So you can throw out most of them uh, when you're talking about the biological birth. There's only a couple uh, referring to him as the Son of God in that context. All right, another statement about this, you know, Jesus being the Son of God or uh, his divine sonship. <clears throat> we have a statement here from James D.G. Dunn uh, from his book, Christology in the Making, 1980. Dunn is pictured above. He's talking about uh, Romans 1.4 and Acts 13.33. Uh, from these scriptures, he says, we may conclude that the first Christians thought of Jesus' divine sonship principally as a role and a status that he had entered upon uh, being appointed to at his resurrection. So it didn't have to do with his birth. It's a status that he had entered upon and he was appointed uh I guess this title, uh, this divine sonship at his resurrection. All right, uh, this may seem a little peculiar to Latter-day Saints who generally think of him, that's Christ, as becoming the son of God through his birth. Uh, nonetheless, in antiquity, it was a common practice to deify kings, <clears throat> to deify kings, and emperors upon their death. Uh, take uh, Caesar Augustus, for example. Uh, he was deified uh, 
and to be to be made a god, I guess, or to be the son of God. Uh, kings and emperors were, were, were used these titles. They were deified uh, upon their death. All right. According to Luke 3.22, a voice was heard at Jesus Christ's baptism. Uh, the voice proclaimed, Thou art my beloved son, as though Christ was already God's son prior to his baptism. Uh, but uh, there's another New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman, who talks about this. <clears throat> uh, I guess Christ becoming the Son of God at his baptism uh, in an adoptionistic sense. Uh, Bart is pictured above. Uh, we're going to quote from his book, Lost Christianities, the battle for scripture and the faiths that we knew and the faith that we never knew, 2003. Uh, so, uh, Bart Ehrman notes, however, that the oldest New Testament manuscripts contain the added clause, Today I have begotten you, indicating that Christ became God's Son through baptism in an adoptionistic sense. So he became God's Son uh, through his baptism in an adoptionistic sense. And the older manuscripts say, today I have begotten you. So that does not refer to his birth. Okay, so what is this adoptionism? What does it mean more uh, particularly? Uh, well, it was a widely held belief uh, before it was first declared a heresy at the end of the second century. It was the belief that Jesus, Jesus was born as a mere human and became divine through adoption at his baptism or his resurrection. So he became the son of God through adoption at his baptism uh, or his resurrection. But he did not become the son of God uh, at birth. He was not conceived. Uh, um, he was not conceived the son of God. And Ehrman suggests, and he's pictured above again, that the phrase in Luke, which we talked about, was likely removed by Trinitarians who opposed adoptionism. So that's interesting. Trinitarians didn't agree with that uh, idea uh, that he became the son of God at his baptism or his resurrection. <clears throat> uh, so maybe these Trinitarians just removed that phrase that he became the son of God. Okay, uh, though Paul and John give different meanings to Christ's divine sonship, neither writer speaks of Christ becoming the son of God through biological birth. So that's interesting. Okay, the issue of birth being born enters into Christ's divine sonship only in the writings of Matthew and Luke, uh, believed to have been written in the late 70s or 80s AD, several decades after Paul and with a different Christology than John. All right, uh, the Gospel of Mark, which is believed to be the earliest gospel, shows no knowledge of Christ's divine birth. Okay, uh, early LDS teachings express Christ's divine sonship much along the same line as contemporaneous Trinitarians, which tended to emphasize either his human nature or his divine pre-existent nature. All right, here's a very interesting statement from Harrell. Uh, notably, nowhere in LDS scripture is Christ expressly referred to as the Son of God because he was begotten of God, either in the spirit or in the flesh. Nowhere in the quad, in the LDS scripture, can you find a scripture that he was begotten of God in the spirit or in the flesh? The earliest LDS teachings seem to refer to Christ as the Son of God in order to denote his human nature. Uh, it is in this sense that Book of Mormon Christology is reminiscent of Orthodox Trinitarianism in its espousal 
of a two-nature view of Christ. It's a two-nature view of Christ in the Book of Mormon. All right, uh, Christ was the Father and the Son. You can look at that in Mosiah 15.2. Uh, he is possessing a divine will and a human will, uh, or a will of the Spirit and a will of the flesh. You can look at uh, Mosiah 15.5 for that. All right, uh, Harold continues. Thus, Christ is called the Son because of the flesh. You can see those uh, passages in the Book of Mormon. Uh, that is because he had a human body. That's why he is the Son because of the flesh, because he had a human body. And he is the Father because he was conceived by the power of God. So notice, he's the Father because he was conceived by the power of the God, power of God. Uh, not the son. You know, you'd think uh, that he would be the son because he was conceived of by the power of God. But in Mosiah 15.3, it says he's the father because he was conceived by the power of God. So it's it's a very Trinitarian uh, theology that you find um, in the Book of Mormon and more, particular, more particularly modalism, which I don't really go into. Uh, so consequently, he was filled with the spirit uh, because he was conceived by the power of God. All right, so Mosiah 15, 1 through 5 in the Book of Mormon uh, really goes over this Trinitarianism uh, well that's in the Book of Mormon. It says, God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. So it's talking about Christ, but it says that Christ is God himself. And because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God, and having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son. So Christ is both the Father and the Son. There's only one God, and then there's different aspects of God, right? That's the Trinity. Uh, the Father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son, because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father and the Son. So Jesus was both the Father and the Son. And they are one God, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and of earth. And thus the flesh becoming subject to the Spirit, or the Son to the Father, being one God. Notice how they repeat that twice. He, su he suffereth temptation and yieldeth not to the temptation, <clears throat> but suffereth himself to be mocked and scourged and cast out and disowned by his people. So it's it's God himself coming down and becoming Christ in the flesh. And then Harold uh, basically says uh, what I just went over. He says, uh, today Latter-day Saints would say that his conception, that's Christ's conception in the flesh by God's power is why he is called the son, not the father. So that's interesting. There's a disagreement with modern teachings today about Christ and what's in the Book of Mormon. He's conceived in the flesh by God. That's why he's called the Son. Uh, but the Book of Mormon says that's why he's called the Father. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, however, Christ is the Son because he took upon him the image of man, or in other words, flesh and blood. See Mosiah 7:27. Thus, he is the son because of his flesh. God is the son because of his flesh. 3 Nephi 1.14 uh, Not because God was his biological father. So the Book of Mormon uh, doesn't teach that Christ is the son uh, because God was his biological father. It teaches that he was the son because of his flesh. All right, so what does the Book of Mormon say about how Christ was conceived? Was he conceived by the Father, the Father coming down and having biological sex with Mary? No, that's not what the Book of Mormon teaches. In the Book of Mormon, Christ was conceived, uh, was conceived of by the Holy Ghost, not the Father. You can look at that in Alma 7.10. Uh, popular uh, Christian teaching at the time of Joseph Smith 
and uh, probably uh, part of Trinitarianism. All right, so Alma 7, uh, 10 teaches this very clearly. It says, And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel. So how could she be a virgin and have sex with a father? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. All right, so she being a virgin... Uh, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. Uh, so how was Christ conceived? It's by the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, not the Father. Uh, that's according to the Book of Mormon. Uh, all right. Uh, it is interesting that in the Book of Mormon, Christ is generally referred to as God or the father prior to his birth, but then he is called the son of God after he is born in the flesh. So uh, very Trinitarian. All right, uh, the theology of the Book of Mormon refers to the pre-incarnate Jesus, I guess in the pre-existence, that he's referred to as the father, the eternal God, the everlasting God, the father of heaven and earth, the Father and the Son, and the Father of all things. Now, all those <laughs> are referring to the pre-incarnate Jesus, Jesus before he came to the earth. All those uh, <laughs> uh, labels as God, as the Father, etc., because it was uh, Trinitarian. In the 1830 Book of Mormon, the Son is used only to refer to the incarnate Jesus. And some of the early revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants uh, were similar. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants 93 uh, similarly refers to Christ as the Son uh, because he was in the world and made flesh his tabernacle and dwelt among the sons of men. So it's still kind of Trinitarian in these earlier revelations in the DNC. Uh, Christ was the Son because he was in the world and made flesh his tabernacle and dwelt among the sons of men. All right, in summary, early Mormonism designates Christ as the son because he took on the finite characteristics of humans, uh, not because he was God's biological son. He, he was the son because he took on the finite characteristics of being human uh, had nothing to do uh, with uh, being God's biological son or God uh, coming down and having sex with Mary. And even in the lectures on faith, it uh, reiterates the same teaching. Uh, in the lectures on faith, it affirms that Christ was called the son because of the flesh. That is because he took upon himself flesh and mortality. All right, so here's a pretty interesting statement, again, by Harrell. Uh, he says, Joseph Smith never referred to Christ as God's begotten Son in either the spirit or the flesh in any of his recorded teachings. So this is a teaching that came later. Joseph Smith never taught it, never taught that Christ was God's only begotten Son in the spirit or the flesh. So... Uh, pre-existence or when he was uh, born in the flesh, um, you know, to Mary. So he never talks about God the Father, uh, you know, coming down and having sex with Mary and being the biological uh, father of Jesus. This was not a teaching of Joseph Smith. It, it came later. Okay, uh, the, the expressions Son of God and Only Begotten Son do not appear to have been used to signify Christ's birth in the flesh until at least the Nauvoo period, in part perhaps because God wasn't perceived as being corporeal until then. In other words, God was uh, perceived as being a spirit, uh, not a, uh, not a, didn't have a body of flesh and bones. Uh, so, you know, when God is in heaven, he doesn't have a body. But when he comes down uh, in the person of Christ, then he has a body. All right. As late as 1840, 
certain Mormon elders were preaching an adoptionistic view of Christ's sonship, stating that in the New Testament, Jesus Christ was never acknowledged to be the Son of God until after his baptism. Certain early <laughs> Mormon elders, uh, as late as 1840, teaching that Jesus was not the Son until after his baptism. That was the, uh, you know, the adoptionistic teaching, a common teaching uh, in Joseph Smith's time. Uh, so he did become the son after his baptism, uh, which made it a covenant relationship with God. All right. Uh, in current LDS theology, Jesus' title of only begotten son uh, has essentially the same meaning as son of God and refers to his to his unique and literal sonship of the father in the flesh so his unique and literal sonship of the father so you know the father was his father biological father had sex with mary etc but uh, that's not taught in the bible it's not taught in the book of mormon it's not even taught in, in early revelations in the doctrine and covenants and in even some uh, of the lectures on faith Okay, uh, such an assertion is a bit of an overstatement, however, as the few references in the New Testament to Christ being God's only begotten Son appear to be in the sense of his being God's only Son from eternity who subsequently dwelt in the flesh. So he's God's only Son from eternity, you know, not necessarily when he was conceived uh, or born. All right, another interesting statement, very direct statement here from uh, Harold. Significantly, none of the standard works ever explicitly refers to Jesus as the only begotten Son of God in the flesh. None of the standard works, uh, none of the Mormon scriptures have that, uh, that verbiage, which refers to Jesus as the only begotten Son of of God in the flesh. All right. Uh, in the New Testament, John's designation of Jesus as God's only begotten Son, or in other words, God's uniquely special Son, you know, not having to do with uh, being born, uh, but this is never suggestive of Christ's birth in the flesh. So these titles or these these uh, statements of only begotten Son. Uh, which basically means uniquely special son, uh, ne are never suggestive of Christ's birth in the flesh. Okay, uh, rather, John seems to call Christ the unique, only one-of-a-kind son of God because he was the only being who actually proceeded forth and came from God. He proceeded forth and came from God, but he was not necessarily begotten of God or, or born of God or, or of, uh, you know, the father being his, uh, his true f physical father. All right. Uh, John contrasts the existence of Christ with the existence of all other humans, stating that Christ was in the beginning with God. John 1, 2 while everybody else's existence begins on earth. You can see the, the John 1 passages there. So that's what made him unique. That's what made him special. He was in the beginning with God, whereas everybody else was created uh, when they came to earth. Uh, but Christ uh, was not created uh, when he came to earth. All right, so the Apostle John therefore spoke of Christ being the only begotten son, evidently because of his coexistence with God from the beginning. So that's why he's the only begotten son, because of his coexistence with God from the beginning. It was not because he later became the only begotten son by being born of God in the flesh. All right, Harold continues, the religious discourse in Joseph Smith's day revived an ongoing debate since early Christianity of whether Jesus was called the only begotten son 
because he proceeded eternally from God, which was called eternal generation, or because he was created by God at some definite point in eternity's past. So this was a debate uh, that was going on, you know, in Joseph Smith's uh, time. And uh, it was a debate actually going on in early Christianity as well. Similar to traditional Christian usage, the title Only Begotten in the Book of Mormon also seems to refer to Christ's unique divine affinity with the Father from before the foundation of the world. All right, uh, Book of Mormon passages speak of the only begotten Son who would come into the world. So in the future, so he was already the only begotten Son before he came into the world. Uh, these Book of Mormon passages uh, do not speak of uh, Christ who would become the only begotten Son by coming into the world. He was already the only begotten Son prior to coming. So it was not that Christ would become the only begotten Son by being born into the world. All right, so here's an interesting uh, scripture in 2 Nephi 25.12. It says, the only begotten of the Father shall manifest himself in the flesh. So he's already the only begotten of the Father. And then in the future, he will manifest himself in the flesh. So he doesn't become the only begotten uh, by, by being born in the flesh. All right, here's another one in Alma 5:48. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and mercy and truth, uh, cometh to take away the sins of the world. So he's, ar he's already the only begotten of the Father, and then he cometh uh, to the earth. Nowhere does the Book of Mormon refer to Christ becoming the only begotten Son of God through being born of God in the flesh. You know, he, he was already the only begotten Son. He was co-eternal with God, and they may actually even be the same being, according to Trinitarianism, and uh, <laughs> the Book of Mormon is uh, Trinitarian. All right, uh, Christ's designation as the only begotten Son of God turns up again in the prophet's revision of the Bible. That's the prophet Joseph Smith. When they say the prophet, that just means Joseph Smith. Uh, so this idea of the only begotten Son turns up again in the JST, Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, particularly in the creation story uh, canonized in the book of Moses. All right, so the account of the JST, Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible, uh, in Moses, book of Moses, contains numerous references to Christ's divine sonship using language akin to that found in the New Testament writings of John. The book of Moses identifies an astonishing 25 times the pre-existent Christ, not the mortal Christ, as God's only begotten. So in the pre-existence, uh, in the JST, it talks about the, the divine sonship of Christ. Okay, once again, these references seem to allude to Christ's special relationship with the Father from the beginning. You can see Moses 1, uh, Moses 5, Moses 6, Moses 7. All right, so a statement here by BYU professor Rodney Turner, basically talking about this issue. It's from a book called The Pearl of Great Price, Revelations from God, 1989. So Turner says, prior to his mortal advent, the only begotten is repeatedly referred to in the present tense in the Book of Mormon and in the Book of Moses. That's prior to his mortal advent. He's referred to as the only begotten son in the Book of Mormon and in the Book of Moses. While it may be argued that this simply means that he was appointed to become so, appointed to become the only begotten son, uh, Turner believes that the tenor of the relevant passages in both of these scriptures is that he was that is that he was functioning as the only begotten son from the beginning so it had nothing to do with being born on the earth 
he uh, he was the only begotten uh, prior to coming to this earth, and he was the only begotten from the beginning. All right, uh, referring to the pre-mortal Christ as the only begotten from the beginning would have made perfect sense to the Trinitarians. And, uh, of course, the Book of Mormon is Trinitarian. All right, uh, early revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants also suggest that Christ was the only begotten Son in glory from the beginning, again with the promise that those who come unto him, come unto Christ, may likewise become sons and daughters. All right, uh, back to BYU professor Rodney Turner. Uh, there's the cover of the book. Uh, Jesus was the first and only spirit begotten into the Father's fullness in pre-mortality. The only spirit begotten into the Father's fullness in pre-mortality or the pre-existence. All others are spiritually begotten through the Son. Or spiritually begotten through Christ or through the Son. Therefore, Jesus is the only begotten of the Father into the fullness of immortal glory. In none of these occurrences of the title Only Begotten Son is it implied that Christ is the only begotten Son of God in the flesh, nor is it stated that he became the only begotten Son of God upon being born uh, in the flesh. All right. Uh, all of the occurrences of the expression Only Begotten Son in the Doctrine and Covenants, as also in the Book of Mormon, and the Pearl of Great Price, all of them seem to reflect the traditional Christian understanding of Christ's glorified status with the Father uh, before the world was. All right, we have a statement here by W.W. W. Phelps. Uh, letters from W.W. W. Phelps, that's William Wine Phelps, uh, to his wife Sally Phelps, September 9, 1835. Uh, so Phelps says, uh, by obeying the laws and commandments of his creator, man might be rewarded with honor and glory in eternity, that he might become a son of the Lord Jesus. He might become a son of the Lord Jesus, for Jesus was the only begotten of the Father. All right, so what general authorities taught that Mary was literally impregnated by God the Father. Well, there was a bunch of them. Uh, the current LDS view that the expression only begotten son means the only begotten son in the flesh has been further understood by many church authorities to mean that Mary was literally impregnated by God the Father. Uh, this idea was taught by James E. Talmadge who was an apostle, Joseph Fielding Smith, who was an apostle, later became the president. Uh, it was taught by the prophet Brigham Young, uh, taught by Ezra Taft Benson, uh, who was an apostle and I guess uh, became uh, the prophet, and also by uh, Bruce R. McConkie. All right, so like we said, uh, one of the people who taught this was the apostle James E. Talmadge. He taught it in his book, Jesus the Christ, which came out in 1915, a book that is uh, still uh, sold, a Deseret Book by the LDS Church, is still considered a, an important uh, book of doctrine and theology on Jesus uh, in the Mormon Church. Uh, so in there, Talmadge says, uh, that child to be born of Mary was, be was begotten of Elohim, the eternal father, not in violation of natural law, but, but in accordance with a higher manifestation thereof. And the offspring from that association of supreme sanctity, celestial sireship, and pure though mortal maternity was of right to be called the son of the highest. In his nature would be combined the powers of godhood, with the capacity and possibilities of mortality, and this through the ordinary operation of the fundamental law of heredity, 
declared of God, demonstrated by science, and admitted by philosophy that living beings shall propagate after their kind. The child Jesus was to inherit the physical, mental, and spiritual traits, tendencies, and powers that characterized his parents, one who was immortal and glorified, who was God, and the other was a, a human, a woman, who was Mary. So he's basically saying, yeah, God the Father came down, had sex with Mary. Uh, he was the fa he sired him. It's his offspring. It was according to natural law. It was according to the law of heredity. Living beings shall propagate. So in a physical, literal sense, uh, God uh, was the physical and literal uh, father of Jesus in the flesh. All right, so Bruce R. McConkie was another one who taught this. Uh, you can find it in uh, Mormon Doctrine, uh, first edition, and probably uh, continuously through other editions. Uh, Christ was begotten by an immortal father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. So <laughs> how are mortal men begotten? Well, it's, you know, through sex. All right, so the prophet Joseph F. Smith also taught this. Uh, pictured above is the first presidency at Joseph F. Smith's time. Uh, he's the one sitting in the middle. So uh, Joseph F. Smith said, The Christian denominations believe that Christ was begotten not of God, but of the spirit that overshadowed his mother. And by the way, that's what's taught in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> but Joseph F. Smith says, this is nonsense. We must come down to the simple fact that God Almighty was the father of his son, Jesus Christ. Mary, the virgin girl who had never known mortal man, was his mother. How could, he, how could Mary be a virgin and also have sex uh, with God? <laughs> Mary was married to Joseph for time. No man could, could take her for eternity because she belonged to the father of her divine son. So Mary was married to Joseph uh, for time and to God the father for eternity. So it's uh, one of God's uh, plural wives. All right, so what do biblical scholars have to say about this idea of God having a sexual relationship with Mary? Uh, well, these scholars maintain that even though there is a precedent for the idea of sexual intercourse between gods and humans in Jewish and Greek mythology, there is no scriptural support for the notion of that God had a sexual relationship with Mary. So there's no biblical support for the notion that God had a sexual relationship with Mary. All right, so Luke 1.35 says that it was the Holy Ghost um, that overshadowed uh, Mary. It says, The Holy Ghost sh shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, but it was through the Holy Ghost. All right, so uh, scholars see the power of the highest being the Holy Ghost. The, the power of the highest is the Holy Ghost, not God, as taught in some LDS commentaries. All right, uh, the biblical scholar Raymond Brown uh, put it like this. Uh, he said, the Holy Spirit is the agency of God's creative power, not a male partner in a marriage between a deity and a woman. So, uh, you yeah, know, God was not married <laughs> uh, to Mary, and God did not have sex with Mary, according to biblical scholars. All right, so it's pretty clear in uh, Matthew 1.18, uh, that Mary was overshadowed and uh, conceived of uh, Jesus uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost. So it says here in Matthew, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, 
she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That was Jesus. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So, yeah, she's a virgin. <laughs> Holy Ghost didn't have sex with her. God didn't have sex with her. She, that's why they called her uh, a virgin. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted which being interpreted is God with us. That means God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name, uh, and he called his name Jesus. I don't, I don't know what it means by any knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Uh, maybe he didn't have sex with her, uh, you know, so that they, they knew it was through the power of the Holy Ghost. All right. Uh, the idea of Christ being literally conceived by God appears nowhere in early LDS scriptures, which all follow the New Testament notion of conception by the Holy Ghost and seem to be based on a theology in which God is incorporeal. In other words, God didn't have a body. God was a spirit. So he could not have sex with Mary and could not be the father. Uh, I believe in the lectures on, lectures on faith, it says that uh, God uh, is a spirit. All right, uh, Alma 7.10 says the same thing. says that uh, Mary was overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost. So we'll read this whole thing. It says, And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. That's Alma in the Book of Mormon. Um, yeah. Jesus conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost. Of course, that's not what Brigham Young taught. You look at this uh, meme above, it said uh, Brigham Young taught that Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so Brigham Young did not know his Book of Mormon. Uh, he says, if the Son was begotten by the Holy Ghost, it would be very dangerous to baptize and confirm females and give the Holy Ghost to them, lest he should beget children. <laughs> It'd be dangerous uh, to give them the, uh, the Holy Ghost, because, hey, they could get pregnant by the Holy Ghost. All right. Uh, related to the LDS doctrine of Christ being the only begotten Son of God in the flesh is the doctrine of the virgin birth, or the more technically accurate virginal conception. All right, so in the Book of Mormon, it talks about this, 1 Nephi 11:15. It uh, confirms the traditional story of the virgin birth, identifying Mary by name and calling her a virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. Okay, of course, for Latter-day Saints who hold the belief that Christ was literally conceived by God the Father, the idea of a virgin birth becomes a bit problematic as it would presumably change Mary's status as a virgin. So I think he's kind of <laughs> understating that, understating that uh, it's more than a bit problematic uh, to me.
All right. So uh, Bruce R. McConkie was, was uh, familiar with his problem, and he tried to do a little bit of apologetics on it. Uh, I don't think very successfully. Uh, this is from uh, his uh, Doctrinal New Testament Commentary, 1965. Uh, Bruce R. McConkie gives his resolution to this conundrum by redefining virgin to mean a woman who has not known a mortal man. McConkie says she conceived and brought forth her firstborn son while yet a virgin because the father of that child was an immortal personage. <laughs> so this is what apologists like to do. They like, like to redefine words. Virgin can't mean virgin, right? Virgin's not a virgin because she was overshadowed by an immortal father who, who still had sex with her. But since he's immortal, it's not really sex, right? <laughs> Uh, she's still a virgin because she's having sex with a god. It just basically makes no sense at all here. Okay. A distinctive LDS doctrine is that Christ was not only the offspring of God as a spirit in the pre-existence, like all God's other children, but he was also the firstborn spirit to whom all others are juniors. So he was the first born spirit of uh, the heavenly parents in the pre-existence. Uh, you can look at the prophet Joseph F. Smith uh, in his book, Gospel Doctrine, 1919, uh, page 70 for that. All right, so the apostle Orson Pratt talked about this in 1876, Christ being the firstborn spirit uh, in the pre-existence. So Pratt says, how long ago since the Savior's birth, this is talking about his birth in the preexistence, how long ago that took place is not revealed. It might have been unnumbered millions of years for aught we know, but we do know that he was born and was the oldest of the family of spirits. All right, uh, so uh, Christ is often referred to by Mormons as our elder brother because we're all uh we were all born as spirits in the pre-existence but christ was the first all right uh, although the title firstborn as it relates to the law of primogeniture was well known in old testament times it often had reference to the preferred status of individuals and nations in god's sight not to their birth order <clears throat> so firstborn could mean other things. Preferred status of individuals and nations in God's sight. It may not necessarily mean a the firstborn like in a literal sense of, of birth. Uh, and as an example of this, uh, the nations of Israel and Ephraim uh, were both designated as God's firstborn. So the whole nation uh, uh, could be firstborn. Okay, uh, speaking of David and his royal dynasty, Psalms 89, 27 declares, I will make him, David, my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. So you could be a uh, uh, firstborn in the sense of uh, being a king. Okay, a statement here from Brent L. Topp. Uh, his book is The Life Before, which came out in 1988. Uh, top is pictured on the right here. Uh, he says, The New Testament contains several references to Christ as the firstborn of God uh, in letters attributed to Paul that some Latter-day Saints understand to mean uh, the firstborn of all of God's spirit children. All right, uh, but Harold does not agree with Top. Uh, he says, but when examined carefully, Paul's teachings show little evidence of a belief that Christ was the firstborn spirit in the preexistence. All right, a statement here from the New Testament scholar George Ladd. He's pictured here on the right. Uh, uh, this book that we're quoting out of is, is called A Theology of the New Testament came out in 1957. So Ladd says, 
that firstborn can have two meanings. Uh, it can mean temporal priority or it can mean sovereignty of position. So kind of like a king. Uh, David, the youngest of eight sons, was to be made the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So firstborn could, could mean uh, sovereignty of a position uh, like, like David, the king. All right. Uh, one instance of Christ's designation as the firstborn is in Romans 8, 29 in the New Testament. Uh, I guess that it was written in A.D. 57. Uh, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Uh, the prophet Joseph F. Smith interpreted this passage in Romans as meaning that the spirits who were juniors to Christ were predestined to be born in the spirit in the image of their elder brother. Uh, but according to scholars, however, Paul is not referring to pre-mortal spirit birth, but to Christ becoming the firstborn in attaining God's glory. Firstborn in attaining God's glory. A status which would subsequently be attained by many brethren, uh, including the disciples. All right, uh, these brethren were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, not born to, in the image of his son, but conformed to the image of his son, meaning that they would become the sons of God in the same adoptive sense in which Christ was seen by Paul as God's son. Another New Testament instance of Christ being called the firstborn is in Hebrews 1.6, uh, where it says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. All right, so, so this passage, Hebrews 1.6, is actually adapted from a text that had reference to Adam's physical creation and had no reference at all to Christ. So it was referring to Adam, uh, not Christ. Several places in the New Testament where Christ is designated as the firstborn have unmistakable reference to his preeminence in the resurrection from the dead. So it has nothing to do with his birth. Okay, in Colossians 1.15, Christ is referred to as the firstborn of every creature. Uh, but the next verse, however, explains, for by him were all things created. All right, uh, the professor Edward Lois uh, interprets this passage for us uh, in his book, Colossians and Philemon. Is that how you say that? Philemon, 1971 uh, commentary. So Lois uh, explains the, the ascription of firstborn to Christ in this passage is not intended to mean that he was created first and thereby began the secession of created beings. Rather, it, re it refers instead to his uniqueness by which he is distinguished from all creation. So it doesn't mean that uh, he was created first. It just uh, talks about his uniqueness uh, by which he is distinguished from all other creations. All right. Uh, significantly, the New International Version of the Bible translates Colossians 1.15 to read that Christ is the firstborn over all creation, thus removing any sense of firstborn being a reference to order of birth much less a spirit birth. So he is the firstborn over all creation, uh, not the firstborn in any kind of an order of birth. And, uh, and they're not really talking about the preexistence either. Okay, uh, with respect to Christ being the firstborn spirit son of God in the preexistence, LDS scholar Tevednes, uh, John Tevednes, 
acknowledges that the Bible itself is hardly proof of this. From the Bible, one can only conclude that Jesus is the first person resurrected from the dead, which, you know, has nothing to do with the pre-existence. Neither the Book of Mormon nor the Pearl of Great Price refers to Christ as the firstborn. The only express mention of Christ being the firstborn in any Latter-day Scripture is in D&C 9321, where Christ declares, And now verily I say unto you, I was in the beginning with the Father, and am the firstborn. All right, uh, notably, this verse in the DNC does not say that he was the firstborn spirit in the preexistence, but simply that he is the firstborn, seemingly indicating his current favored status with God, not unlike the way Israel was anciently referred to as God's firstborn. So that's interesting. Eh? Uh, all of Israel, a nation, I guess, was also uh, considered God's firstborn. Uh, moreover, those who are spiritually born again through Christ share the same glory or favored status as the firstborn. All right, uh, so DNC 9322 reads, and all those who are begotten through me are partakers of the glory of the same and are the church of the firstborn. The doctrine that Christ was the firstborn spirit child of God does not appear in LDS teachings until after the death of Joseph Smith and was part of the larger doctrine of spirit birth that was beginning to take shape in the later part of 1844. So Joseph Smith did not uh, teach this uh, uh, doctrine. The first documented public reference to spirit birth which also alludes to Christ as our brother, comes from Orson Pratt's Prophetic Almanac for 1845. As the emphasis on Christ being the firstborn spirit offspring of God grew from this point, scriptural references to the firstborn were reinterpreted to provide supporting proof texts for this doctrine. All right, uh, another title from the scriptures that Latter-day Saints generally understand as referring to Christ is Son of Man. So that's another title, Son of Man, which supposedly, according to L the LDS, it refers to Christ, uh, usually equating with Son of God. According to the Apostle Joseph Fielding Smith, Son of Man is derived from God's title, Man of Holiness, uh, which is recorded in the Pearl of Great Price. It says Man of Holiness in Moses 6, 57. Uh, Thus, the Son of Man is an abbreviation for the Son of Man of Holiness, or in other words, the Son of God. In the Old Testament, Son of Man appears in several places, but it, but it is never as a title for Christ. Many Christians, including the Latter-day Saints, argue that the occurrence of Son of Man in Daniel 7.13 is an exception. All right, uh, the Apostle James E. Talmadge stated uh, that the distinctive title, the Son of Man, as applied to Jesus Christ, occurs only once in the Old Testament. It is in the seventh chapter of Daniel. Daniel 7 describes a vision in which one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. If Daniel was actually referring to Christ, one wonders why he didn't simply call him the Son of Man instead of one like the Son of Man. In modern translations and scholarly commentaries, this phrase in Daniel is rendered as follows one like a son of man, one like a son of man, signifying a man-like figure. So uh, it basically saying one like a human being. All right, the Bible scholar Matthias Hens uh, gives us some more information uh, in his book, The New Interpreter Study Bible, 2003. 
Hens says, uh, though the traditional interpretation is that the Son of Man is the Messiah or Christ, uh, modern scholars understand the Son of Man to ref refer either to the faithful Jews or to an angelic being, uh, but not to Christ. And Hens is pictured above. All right, a comment from James D.G. Dunn uh, in his book, Christology in the Making, 1989. Uh, Dunn says, There is no evidence that there existed prior to Christianity a belief in a heavenly son of man who would appear from heaven as Israel's Messiah. The title Son of Man appears nowhere in the Book of Mormon. Uh, in the Book of Moses, it seems to allude to the eternal relationship Christ has with the Father, much like the title Only Begotten Son. All right, the next uh, name we're going to go over is uh, Jehovah. Latter-day Saints consider Jehovah to be Christ's eternal name, especially, especially the name by which he was known in the pre-existence. Latter-day Saints generally assume that all occurrences of Jehovah in the scriptures are references to Christ. Okay, this perspective, however, is not shared by many LDS scholars. BYU Old Testament professor Keith Maservi, for example, wrote in the June 2002 Enzyme that in at least three Old Testament passages, it appears that the word Lord in capital letters applies to Heavenly Father and uh, not Jesus Christ. And so I guess in the Old Testament, the KJV, they translated the word Jehovah uh, into the word Lord. So you could reread this and it says, in at least three Old Testament passages, it appears that the word Jehovah applies to Heavenly Father, not Jesus Christ. And um, a survey is uh, pictured above. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew Jehovah or Yahweh is the name title applied to God, meaning self-existent one. So when uh, they talk about the words Jehovah or Yahweh, they're talking about God, uh, not Christ. In the KJV Old Testament, Jehovah is usually translated Lord in uppercase letters and was used interchangeably with Elohim or God. So uh, Jehovah, as translated Lord in the Old Testament, it was used interchangeably with Elohim or God. So it's, Jehovah is referring to God the Father, uh, not Jesus. All right, Deuteronomy 6.4 reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord or Jehovah our God, Elohim, is one Lord or Jehovah. So just using the translation uh, of the word Lord as Jehovah, we can reread that and it says, Hear, O Israel, uh, Jehovah our God, Elohim, is one Jehovah. Uh, and the name or title Jehovah does not appear in the English New Testament. Among Christian preachers and theologians at the time of Joseph Smith, uh, the title Jehovah was generally understood as just another name for God. Uh, also, in early Mormon scripture, uh, Jehovah was also used as a generic reference to God, so in early Mormonism. All right, some interesting information here from Boyd Kirkland. He's pictured on the right here. Uh, he wrote a chapter in the book Line Upon Line. Uh, we're going to quote from this uh, now. Uh, he says, After the identities of the Father and the Son were more carefully differentiated in Mormon theology around 1835, Joseph Smith clearly began to use the divine name Jehovah to refer to the Father. Let me restate that. <laughs> Joseph Smith used the divine name of Jehovah to refer to the Father, not the Son. Uh, significantly, he apparently never specifically identified Jehovah as Jesus, 
as a lot of uh, later general authorities would do. Uh, nor did he identify Jehovah as the son of Elohim. Okay, the Book of Mormon has only two occurrences of the title Jehovah, both of which appear to refer to God, the Father, rather than specifically to Christ. The first time Jehovah appears in the DNC is at the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple in March of 1836. All right, so in this prayer at the Kirtland Temple, uh, Joseph Smith prays to the Holy Father, and he calls him uh, Jehovah. So it says, uh, in this prayer to the Holy Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Joseph pleads, O oh, Jehovah, have mercy on this people. So he's praying uh, to Jehovah. All right, uh, another comment here from uh, Boyd Kirkland. He says that after Joseph Smith studied Hebrew in 1835-1836 time frame, uh, Joseph began using Elohim to designate the supreme being and also began to use Jehovah more often and use them interchangeably as epithets for God the Father. So Joseph Smith ca called God the Father Elohim. He also called him Jehovah. He used those uh, uh, two words interchangeably. All right, here's another example of uh, Joseph Smith praying to Jehovah. Uh, it was recorded in 1842, and uh, Joseph Smith said in the prayer, O thou eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent Jehovah, God, thou Elohim. So it's Jehovah, God, thou Elohim, all kind of together, uh, that sittest as saith the psalmist, enthroned in heaven. Surprisingly, the first recorded instance of the title Jehovah being applied uniquely to Christ doesn't occur until 1885. <laughs> what is that, like 40 years later or more? Uh, this was in a sermon by Apostle Franklin D. Richards on August 30, 1885, and Richards is pictured above. All right, so the name title Jehovah has since become recognized in Mormonism as Christ's pre-mortal name and the name by which he was known in the Old Testament. Uh, but this use of the name title Jehovah did not make sense uh, to the Mormon educator uh, Lowell L. Benyon, pictured above here. Uh, this comes um, from an article in Sunstone in 1980 from Benyon. Uh, he says, when Christ was on the earth, he taught his disciples to worship the Father. It doesn't seem logical to me that Christ would ask in the Old Testament to be worshipped when they're supposed to be worshipping the Father and not have the Father worshipped as in other scriptures in other dispensations. The, Jew, the Jews and their Old Testament ancestors considered Elohim and Jehovah to be two names for God, which both refer to a single de deity. So that's what the Jews thought. That's uh, their ancestors in the Old Testament thought that Elohim and Jehovah uh, were just two names uh, for God. All right, uh, the modern use of the name title Jehovah as an exclusive designation for the pre-mortal Christ is a, is a convention made official through a doctrinal exposition entitled Christ as the Father and the Son, published by the First Presidency in 1916. <clears throat> so, yeah, this was not a, a teaching of Joseph Smith or of the early church. Okay, uh, this use, however, is a 20th century development that did not exist in early Mormonism, neither is it evident in LDS scripture. All right, so the first presidency here is pictured above uh, in 1916. Uh, Joseph F. Smith was the prophet uh, in, the <clears throat> uh, in the center of the picture here. <clears throat> um, in LDS theology, uh, the name title Father is applied to Christ in three distinctive ways, 
enumerated in the 1916 First Presidency Statement. Number one, he was the father as the creator. Number two, as the father of eternal life or spiritual rebirth. And number three, as the father by divine investiture of authority. Okay, the only Old Testament occurrence of the name title Father that Christians, including the Latter-day Saints, view as a reference to Christ is Isaiah 9-6, where it says, Unto us a child is born, and his name shall be called the Everlasting Father. Uh, so Mormons and, and Christians think that that may be referring to Christ. Uh, are they correct? All right, some information about this from the Bible scholar John Sawyer, pictured above here on the right. His book is The Fifth Gospel, Isaiah in the History of Christianity, 1996. He says, although there are some 250 references to Isaiah uh, in the New Testament to support Christian themes, uh, this passage that we talked about is never once cited in spite of its wide recognition today among Christians as a prophecy fulfilled in Christ. Uh, neither is Father ever applied to Christ in the New Testament. Instead, Jesus referred to God as my Father and your Father. All right, some more information from the biblical scholar J.J.M. Roberts, uh, professor of Old Testament literature at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, in his book, uh, HarperCollins Study Bible, 1993, he sees Isaiah 9-6 as an oracle for the coronation of a Judean king, probably Hezekiah. So he doesn't look at that passage in Isaiah 9-6 as referring uh, to Christ. All right, so Roberts continues here. Uh, the epithets bestowed on the king in Isaiah 9-6, uh, which are wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, all of these are coronation names like those given Egyptian kings at their ascension. So it's probably talking about some type of a king, uh, not Jesus. At the time of Joseph Smith, Trinitarians used the name title Everlasting Father or Eternal Father to signify Christ's identity with the Father in the sense of Jesus' possessing the same nature as the Father. So the Trinitarian idea. In the Book of Mormon, Christ is called the Father and the Son in a sense that seems to be referring to to two different aspects of his nature, but only one God, that of his divine nature and, and that of his human nature. All right, as to his divine nature, the Book of Mormon states that Christ is called the Father but, uh, because he was conceived by the power of God, Mosiah 15.3. Today, Latter-day Saints would say that his conception by the power of God is why he is called the Son, not the Father. So it gets kind of confusing here. This is different from any of the three ways explained in the First Presidency exposition previously cited. All right, a little bit of information here from Dan Vogel, uh, pictured above. Uh, he also has a chapter in the book, Line Upon Line, which came out in 1989. It's also dealing with... Um, uh, the same subject uh, that's in this video. So Vogel says, uh, after May 1833, perhaps as the result of the father and son becoming more differentiated in LDS thought, Joseph Smith ceased using the term father when referring to Christ. But I, I guess uh, he, he used to. The Book of Mormon additionally refers to Christ as the father in the sense of being the creator of heaven and earth. This title, however, is not attributed to Christ separately and distinctly from God the Father, because the Book of Mormon is Trinitarian. The Book of Mormon speaks of a single God 
with Christ as merely the embodied manifestation of the one eternal God. So there's only one God, kind of as pictured above in this diagram. Christ is the embodied manifestation of that one eternal God. And then he can also uh, be uh, the Holy Spirit. And he's also uh, the Father. All right, some information from Elijah Bailey. Uh, talking about uh, Trinitarianism. Uh, he says, John Wesley and other evangelicals similarly taught that since Christ was the creator of all things under the Father, he can appropriately be considered identical to the everlasting Father. So this idea of the Trinity. And uh, the picture here is of John Wesley. Okay, uh, current LDS teachings are emphatic in declaring Christ to be the God of the Old Testament. Uh, Bruce R. McConkie deemed it a fact that Jehovah slash Christ is the God of Israel or of the Old Testament and that he and not the Father spoke to all the ancient prophets, all, all those prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, but there is little indication after the exile that the Israelites understood the God they worshipped to actually be the Son of God. Even the New Testament speaks of God the Father, not Christ, as the God of the Old Testament. The Apostle Peter equated the God of ancient Israel with God the Father, stating, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob the God of our fathers hath glorified his son, Jesus. So that's saying, you know, the God of the Old Testament, the God of those uh, Old Testament uh, prophets and peoples, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, was uh, God the Father, not Jesus the Son. Similarly, Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 starts out, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So God in times past, speaking to uh, the fathers by the prophets of the past, presumably the Old Testament, that's God the Father. But in the later days, the Christian era, I guess, he speaks to us uh, through his Son. Okay, uh, given the strong Jewish monotheistic background of New Testament writers, scholars question whether any of those New Testament writers uh, perceive Christ to be fully God. Okay, uh, at the time of Joseph Smith, opinions differed about whether the God of the Old Testament was Christ or God the Father. Modern Mormon scriptures are somewhat ambivalent about the identity of the God of the Old Testament, speaking at times as though it, as though it is God the Father, and at other times as though it is Christ. Okay, in the Book of Mormon, Jesus is not a God, or even ontologically distinct from God, but instead is the very God. See Mormon 3.21. So that idea of the Trinity. He, Jesus is the very God. All right. You can take a look at the title page of the Book of Mormon. Uh, the one on this slide is the 1830 first edition. Uh, but it still says the same thing that I'm going to quote here on the title page of the 2021 uh, version of the Book of Mormon that you can find on the church's website. Uh, so the Book of Mormon was written as a witness that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. So that's interesting. Even on the title page, you know, it's, it's uh, teaching these Trinitarian ideas. So you can look at the orange line above where it says Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. And that's still on the title page today. Okay, uh, as Mormons began to embrace tritheism after 1843, they increasingly spoke of God the Father as the God of the Old Testament. Uh, you can see the 
picture above or diagram above on the right here for tritheism. Uh, the other side is uh, Sibelianism. I'm not sure what that is. And this tradition, I guess tritheism, can be seen particularly in the teachings of the prophet Brigham Young. Uh, but it wasn't until the turn of the 20th century that the role of Christ as God of the Old Testament uh, became so strongly affirmed. Okay, the Apostle James E. Talmadge helped to solidify this view in his 1915 Jesus the Christ. Uh, in there on page 32 it says, We claim scriptural authority for the assertion that Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament. So at this point, you know, Jesus was determined uh, by Talmadge and the First Presidency shortly thereafter uh, that Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament, uh, that Jehovah uh, was another name for Jesus, and uh, Jehovah was the God of the Old Testament. Uh, but that still leaves us with uh, some confusion, which Harold points out here in the Book of Moses. Uh, Harold says, so when the Lord God Almighty appears to Moses and tells him all about his only begotten son, we are to understand that it, it is actually Christ speaking as though he is the father. So it's as though Christ is the Lord God Almighty uh, <laughs> and uh, tells about his only begotten son. So it really doesn't make sense. The son... Uh, telling about the son or the son testifying of the son gets very confusing. Uh, and according to the apostle Joseph Fielding Smith, God the Father has never spoken to man since the fall except to introduce his son. So I guess, I guess uh, like in the first vision. And that is going to do it for this video. We went about an hour and a half. I thought it might go longer, but uh, we wrapped it up in an hour and a half. Uh, 186 slides, so <laughs> uh, this this turned out to be a lot more work than I had initially planned. This is probably going to be the end of the Evolution of Mormon Doctrine uh, series. We did the Godhead, uh, we did God the Father, and now we did Jesus Christ. Uh, this one uh, turned out to be the longest. There's, there's the most, uh, you know, scriptural passages and stuff to go over for Jesus Christ. Uh, but that's going to do it. And I thank you for watching the Evolution of Mormon Doctrine, Jesus Christ video.